Welcome to the Cinema Rat, where we celebrate the greatest and worst in Hollywood films and their most self-indulgent, narcissistic actors, directors, and producers. Here, we will laud and malign Hollywood's seedier elements with levity and humor. They love cinema as much as anyone does. And they've been talking about it for over 30 years. Time to get trashy. Here's Gregory and May. Hello, everybody. This is Gregory, and welcome back to another episode of the Cinema Rag. I hope you're doing well today. Today, we're going to start an inaugural series called Dad Corner, where I'm going to look back at movies from the past from a dad's perspective. I am a father because this would not make sense if I was not a father. And I will pick movies where when I was younger, when I saw these movies, I did not see this as undermining of parental or adult authority because I was young. And now when I watch these movies again, I'm like, oh my God, I agree with the parents. (laughs) And I don't relate at all to the protagonist. So we're going to do three movies today, two John Hughes movies and a Disney movie. So let's get to it. Some Kind of Wonderful. I've talked about this movie before. I think in the first 30 episodes, I did uh, an episode on my five favorite romantic comedies. And I believe I mentioned Some Kind of Wonderful there. It is my personal favorite of the John Hughes, though it's typically not regarded as his best. It is, in theory... A flip of Pretty in Pink or Pretty in Pink. It's the poor girl with the rich guy, played by Andrew McCarthy, and some kind of wonderful. It's flipped. Eric Stoltz is the poor guy who falls in love with Leia Thompson, who is the rich girl. Now, if you don't know this movie, well, come on. Unless you're under the age of 20, you should know the plot of the basic of the five major John Hughes movies. So, really quickly, in some kind of wonderful, Eric Stoltz, redhead, blue-eyed kid, working class. He has a crush on a girl who's also from a, the working class neighborhood, but she's a richie in that she hangs out with the popular crowd because she's beautiful, Amanda Jones. And Amanda is with a, you know, a guy, treats her like garbage, obviously. And Eric Stoltz's character has a friend by the name of Watts. She's a drummer. They're close friends. And that's played iconically by Mary Stuart Masterson. Uh, this is probably, I mean, not not well-known actress overall, but this is one of her probably most iconic roles. She was in The Hateful Eight most recently. At least that's the last time I remember her being pretty relevant. And it's just like Pretty in Pink, where she kind of represents the ducky role played by John Cryer. And so what happens is Eric Stoltz's character, Keith is his name. Keith is a bright kid. His dad wants him to go to college. He's got the grades to go to college. He's been saving up money to go to college. And he has a crush on Amanda Jones, of course. The dad is telling him, focus less on girls and more on college makes sense and eventually he gets to go out on a date with amanda and he's he's fixated on this he gets watched to be the chauffeur and what you find out later is on this very elaborate date he takes her to the hollywood bowl he gets uh, her, his friend to open up an art museum i think this is probably in la i make the assume the, the la art museum where they have this private tour at night. He is a painter. And so while they're walking around in the art gallery, there's a painting of Amanda Jones that he painted. And it's up in the gallery. And then he buys her diamond earrings. And you find out later that he blew all of his college tuition on diamond earrings. Now, I think about like, this is 1986. I think about 1986 U.S. dollars where like what did college tuition cost like back then before it was deregulated and now of course it is just insanely high even at a public university but either way he blows all of his college money on earrings for a first date with a girl who has never expressed interest in him at all what a simp how stupid are you but again this is a movie there's programming and of course, she likes the earrings. Later on, there's a little brush bag. She's like, you know, 
you you just idealize me, you do a painting of me, da da da. You're using me as much as I'm using you because she was using him to get back at the jerky boyfriend. But he has obviously pedestalized her the, the whole time in high school and he wanted to have this perfect date so she would fall in love with him. And of course the irony is at the end of the movie, he chooses what? So he blows all this money for no reason. So as a father... I would be beating the crap out of my kid. Okay, women in California, it's a hyperbole. I'm not going to beat children. But if I was the father, I'd be like, you are a freaking moron. At the end of the movie, she does give the earrings back. And he gives the earrings to Watts. I'd be like, uh, if I was a dad, no pawn shop. You're going to college. You're not going to be with this weirdo drummer girl Watts. Just, but we see this movie. Oh, it's so romantic. It's so romantic. Yeah, no. Stupid kids in high school have no wisdom making stupid decisions. They have long-term ramifications. Number two, Breakfast Club. Iconic John Hughes movies. Right? We all know. Uh, we all know Breakfast Club. I watched this about a week ago with somebody who has never seen this movie. And I've probably, I was 10 when this movie came out. It was iconic. I remember seeing in the movie theaters. My parents did not really supervise me. I remember seeing a lot of R-rated movies or inappropriate movies for 10-year-olds in the movie theaters. I remember seeing Beverly Hills Cop. I remember seeing Revenge of the Nerds in movie theaters when I was 10. I just sneak into these theaters back in the 80s. So Breakfast Club has a very undermining toward authority, rebellious streak through it. Now, when you are young, and you typically watch these movies for the first time, probably as tweens, high schoolers, you don't see it because you identify with one of the five or a combination of the five major characters. And you certainly aren't going to relate to the principal or the janitor or the parents. But if you watch Breakfast Club again, watch it from a parent perspective, right? It, it One of the great lines, and here's my take on Breakfast Club. I think the first half is great. When they finally get to the second half where they're all sitting around and spilling their beans as to why they're there, I think the movie becomes a really bad melodrama, to be honest. And it's so unrealistic on so many levels. Though on some levels it's realistic, like Claire... Molly Ringwald's character ending up with Bender. That's totally realistic on one level because... I wouldn't say ending up together because they're not going to end up together, obviously. Let's take a break. I wanted to let you know about some of the other feeds here at the Eclecto Gregorio. The oldest one we have is The Awakened Man, which mostly deals with holistic health, medical cover-ups, ways to biohack your life to ensure longer longevity, medical conspiracies, and naturopathic stuff. We also have, and that there's probably about 400, 500 episodes over there. We started that one back in 2017, 2016, I believe. We also have the Female Holistic Health Apothecary, which originally started as an essential oils feed. And there's about 100 episodes on essential oils, particular essential oils like rose and lavender and sandalwood and so forth. And then later I morphed it into more topics that are regarded for female health, female specific We've had that feed also since 2016. And then lastly, we have Confessions of an Obese Child, which deals with my childhood obesity and trauma that came from it. So it's a great feed for those who dealt with childhood trauma that led you to have addictions to alcohol or food. And I interview several people and what it was like to grow up overweight and all the difficulties of losing the weight and then keeping it off and trying to metamorphosize into a regular weighted person. So check out those feeds at the Eclectical Gregory on Apple or Spotify. But why she would find Bender attractive is so typical woman, right? Bad boy. Bad boy who negs her all the time, ignores her all the time, just makes her want him more. She's going through the wallet of all the women he's been with and banned. And even though... She says, oh, you're such a pig. Deep down, she likes it because it's social proof. It demonstrates that he is a Lothario. 
And ultimately, you know, they have the kiss together. And again, what is this Hollywood programming? You should go with guys with no futures. No. Who have se- severe childhood trauma who are likely going to end up beating their future children? No. Then then also, Ali Shitty gets cleaned up and the jock is going to like that character. I mean, it's just trope after trope. But either way, the principle's right. These people are reprobates. They're reprobates, especially Bender. Benders are reprobate. But on, on one level, these kids are back talking smart asses. And then the parents, you notice the little things out all of them. There's that conversation between Bender and Claire. It's like, which of your parents you like more? And she's like, well, they're just both using me to get to get back at each other, da 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 da. And there's just other examples where the, any adult in this movie is considered a bad person. And the only people that have wisdom are the idiot 16, 17-year-olds that are in this movie. They have some keen wisdom on the world, and the adults have none. Emilio Estevez's dad wants him to get a scholarship to, to go to college. That makes sense. Ali Sheedy's parents don't want her to be a weirdo. That makes sense. Brian's parents probably put a lot of pressure. I get that. I get that. But they want him to have success. Same for Claire. I'm sure, you know, the fact that she's a virgin is probably something that the parents would like. Yes, these are all good things. And then look, the principal, kind of a jerk, obviously. But he's right when he's lamenting with the janitor when he's going through the files, like, this is our future, this is our future. And he was right. Look at the people who... Look at, look, you know, we thought in the 80s, the 80s were bad. Look at now. Oh my God, society is decadent, depraved, and falling apart. So the adults are crapped on this movie. It's, and it's an exceedingly subversive movie. And I, I really recommend you watch it again. Number three is Little Mermaid. We do have an episode here on Little Mermaid on the live action one. Why it's not going to get close to getting to a billion dollars, which is what the live action Aladdin did, the last live action they did. And it's never going to be iconic like the cartoon version, the animation version, I should say. This movie, we're going to talk about the animated version because I'm not going to watch the new you know, PC revisionist one. It's the, the classic trope of Junior Knows Best. So Ariel, I mean, <laughs> Ariel just turned 16. Just turned 16. She's naive and she's stupid. King Triad, don't go to the shore. You can't trust humans. Ariel doesn't understand. Why? Because she's innocent and naive and she's 16. She doesn't understand that humans would kill them. You know, this is played out in another Disney movie 30 years later, Luca, right? The, 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 the humans won't understand you. They think you're a sea monster. Kill, they'll kill you. She's stupid. She doesn't get it. She keeps disobeying her father. Then, of course, she sees Eric, falls in love with Eric. How can you fall in love with somebody who, A, isn't your species, B, you've never spoken to in your life? Also, Eric, the way they draw him, looks like he's 35. Ariel looks like she's, six, I guess, 16. But he looks like he's 35. This is like the flip of Titanic where DiCaprio looks like he's 14 and Kate Winslet looks like a woman. So Triton finds out through Sebastian the Crab that she has, quote, fallen in love with a human. Of course he goes ballistic. Any parent would go ballistic. She doesn't understand that humans would kill her Or torture her or whatever. You know, I guess this is 19th century Europe. I don't know where they are. But if this was like in present day, it'd kind of be like a ripoff of Shape of Water. They would do, you know, investigations on him and all these things, torture her. But they certainly, they would kill her. They wouldn't treat her well. And even if Eric treats her well, not all humans would treat her well. Either way, he flips out. He takes everything away from her. Understandable. She doesn't understand the dangers. She's 16 and stupid and thinks she's in love with somebody she's never met. Then she goes to Ursula the Witch, who 
you know, it's not not it's not even so <laughs> poorly telegraphed is obviously queer. She goes to Ursula, who of course represents the devil, and, and it's and it's not even like thinly veiled. You can clearly tell she sells herself. It's like it's like Faust. It's the old Goethe novel of Faust. She sells herself, sells her soul to the devil. Again, Ariel lacks wisdom, lacks foresight. All she thinks about is I want Eric to love me. So she essentially gives her soul to the devil because Ursula knows that within three days it's not going to work. Just like when she shows the other two. Souls, the one that the fat mermaid and the ugly mermaid about how that you know this is what they want because that's what she does. She takes advantage of mermaids and mermaid and mermans. And I just, when I think of mermaids, I just think of Zoolander when he goes back and visits the dad and you know there's the Zoolander commercial. John Boy plays the dad and Vince Vaughn has an uncredited role as the brother and he's on the TV. They're at the bar in West Virginia where he's from. And there's a commercial about water is the essence of beauty or something like that. And he's a mer- he's a merman. And then John Voight, the dad, gets mad. He says, how do you expect me to feel? Everyone here thinks I got a, you know, I don't know what word he is. Like a weirdo son who's a mermaid. And <laughs> Zoolander goes, it's merman. I'm a merman. Anyway, so she takes advantage of mermaids and mermans using their insecurities. Because she knows they're not going to get what they want. And so they, they, these these wretched souls end up being hers. And so, you know, Ur- Ursula is smart. She's conniving. And Ariel is dumb as dirt. Signs her soul away. And then she goes and becomes a human. Now, I mean, we could play on so many of the beauty tropes that are in this movie and Beauty and the Beast, which are back-to-back movies at, of the Disney Renaissance when they came out. And they're both like, beauty means nothing. What are you talking about? Beauty means everything in both of these movies. Even Ursula says, when, when, when Ariel says, I'm not going to have my voice, she's like, well, you'll have your feminine wiles. You'll have your moves. You'll have your, your face. You'll have your beauty. And why does Eric fall in love with her? Eric falls in love with her because she's pretty. She's 16, but whatever. She's pretty. If she looked ugly... Eric wouldn't like her, but this is classic Disney tropes, right? All the princesses, all the princes, all the princes like the girls because they're pretty, right? And all the princesses like the guys because they're knights or they're rich or something like that. So then you know how the story plays out. But eventually, daughter knows best, junior knows best, because Triton, after all the crap that goes down, because of her, he becomes Ursula's, you know, whatever, servant. After all of this, what does he do? Because he realizes that Ariel, quote, loves Eric after knowing him for three days. Three days! Turns her into a human. What? What? propaganda garbage is this you know what i would have done you're gonna get your butt back down in the sea because a you're 16 and you're underage who knows in this world you know i i I don't know what's going on if this is you know back in the day yes once a girl had her period she'd be married off but i'd be like you don't know this guy and he's a human (laughs) but you know i love you so much my daughter i'm never gonna see you i'm gonna turn you into a human and yeah, no, no, no. Be like, you're getting your butt back into the ocean. Clearly, her sisters aren't married off, so 16 isn't the normal age that you would get married. You need to get some wisdom. You're going to be grounded for like 60 years because you put everybody in danger. No, but the movie is, you know what? Let's reward Ariel and turn her into a human. Hell no. Hell no. Guys, I would really appreciate you rate and review this channel. I'll post a poll over at Spotify and at the Cinema Rec Facebook group, and you can let me know what you think of my takes on these three movies. There's a link for PayPal. Lastly, there's a link in the episode notes as well for the website that hosts all the Eclectical Gregorio feeds. Until next time, take care. God bless them. Thanks for listening to the Cinema Rack. Please post an honest review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. Check out the episode notes to visit our website and to make a donation. Lastly, follow the rag today. Until next time.